Hi, uh, my name is Amitab Clem, and you are watching the TV Writer Podcast. So I want to tell you a little bit about our main sponsor for the episode. Script Anatomy is a screenwriting school that gets incredible results. In just four years, their students have won 58 fellowships, half of them at major studios. In 2020 alone, Script Anatomy won four out of 11 fellowships at CBS and three out of eight at Warner Brothers. Why? Because the instructors are all working writers with current credits. They teach a consistent tool-based program and they treat students like emerging professionals. To get your writing career started, go to scriptanatomy.com. My name is Gray Jones and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine. Well, today I have an interview with um, Script Anatomy instructor, TV writer, director, and a whole bunch of other things, Amitab Klim. How are you doing? Hi, good. Good to be here. Um, and you really have done a whole pile of different stuff and I'm, I'm really excited to hear about all of that. We're going to talk about your Script Anatomy work in the second half of the uh, interview, but first let's get to know you a little bit. Sure. So you started out in, was it Iowa? Yeah, so I was, um, I was born in Iowa and uh, uh, we moved around a whole bunch when I was a kid and ended up growing up uh, in one of the suburbs of Chicago called Naperville. And uh, then went back to, I actually ended up going to um, University of Iowa for college and did uh, um, an English major there and sort of minored in business. And, um, you know, this entire time we're moving around and like I'd always sort of like, I'd always been in love with movies, I'd always watched movies. Um, and, you know, when I was like 15, you know, you start, if you're really into it, you start like, or when you're earlier, 15 is when it really kind of kicked off for me, I think 15, 14. And I started just consuming, you know. And even when I was a little kid, like I really, I loved them. Like, I would get like up in the middle of the night to watch movies alone, just so I could be like, just, just be fully like immersed. Um, I remember when Terminator 2 came out, like I campaigned my dad. So I played like piano like my entire life. And so every Saturday I'd have a lesson. And, um, and so the, the treat afterwards is that you go to the video store, we used to have video stores in those days, you know, and um, it's not that long ago. <laughs> but, um, you know, and so you get to rent a movie for the weekend. That was like the treat, right? And I campaigned for six months to let him, uh, let me see Terminator 2. Like it, like every weekend. And then um, he said that the reason he said yes was because a colleague of his said, Arnold Schwarzenegger literally says, I swear I would not kill anybody. And he was like, that was enough. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, it doesn't kill anybody. That's fine. So, you know, um, uh, you know, so yeah, cool. um, movies have always been a big deal. Mm -hmm. you know. And then you ended up get, taking an MFA at USC. Talk about that. Yeah, um, so I, when I was in Iowa, I'm gonna, the, the, the beginning of that really happened in Iowa. Um, Cause I took a film studies class and I kind of like, you know, from where I'm like the kind of the family that I'm from, you know, it's like a lot of scientists, but also it's like, you know, pig farmers and stuff like that, you know? Um, and like my, my grandfather grew up like on a farm and he became a chemist and, you know, he just taught himself how to do it, you know? and convinced his high school principal to buy him a chemistry set and then he became a scientist and my dad became a scientist and so there's always this sort of like idea of like escapism, you know? Um, and you know, it's like I'm biracial and so when you grow up in America like that, you're sort of always trying to like sort of figure out where you sort of are in the whole scheme of things. I mean, people, that's part of the human condition, but you know, it's very sort of physically evident with this, you know? Um, and, um, and so movies are always that sort of way for me to kind of like, all right, well, where do I fit, you know? Um, and um, I remember I took this film class um, uh, with this uh, great professor named Dr. Rick Altman. And we watched like these fabulous, you know, Greta Garbo movies and we watched Top Hat, which is amazing. Um, it's just such a lovely film. And we closed the semester up by watching Do the Right Thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy, I was like, I didn't know you could do that with a movie. I just didn't. And, you know, and growing up, I like, you know, so you start off with Back to the Future and Terminator 2. But then, you know, really got into like sort of watching all of Kubrick and watching like all of like Sergio Leone films and like, getting into sort of European films and, you know, really kind of just sort of amassing this sort of like, this sort of love of it, but always avoiding wanting to go into cinema. Because like I said, it's like we come, I came from this sort of very sort of more practical family. And so I sort of envisioned my life as being kind of like, like um, Kevin Bacon and she's having a baby. You know, I'm just like, I'm just gonna work in advertising and, you know, live in the suburbs and then I'll sort of noodle on a novel on a weekend and, be mostly satisfied with my life, you know? Um, yeah, and then I saw it do the right thing and I was like, holy shit. And it really, like, it really kind of spoke to that sort of, that sort of push and pull that I had sort of experienced of like, 
thinking, because my father's white and like went to Harvard and Stanford, so it's like this very much establishment kind of thing. Um, but growing up biracial, it's kind of like non-establishment thing, you know? And um, there's this exchange, this exchange at the end of the film with Ruby Dee and Ozzy Davis, and they're like, are we gonna live together, together, are we gonna live? And I was like, I just never heard that before. I'd never heard kind of like that sort of whole life experience sort of surmised like that before. And I was like, that's it, this is what I'm gonna do. And so I went to summer school, I did an entire semester of college in summer school, because once you know what you want to do, you know, it's like, when Harry met Sally at the end, it's like, when you, don't, you figure out the person you want to be with, the, you want the rest of your life to start as soon as possible. And I was like, that's what it was with, with movies. And, um, and uh, so I did a whole semester worth of school in one summer, I graduated early. Um, and then because I, like, I did, you know, pretty decent with my grades, I got like a graduation present. Uh, it was a plane ticket to Sydney, Australia. And so I went down there to do sort of like work experience um, before, because I didn't want to like just come to Hollywood and be like, hey, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I'm from Iowa. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to do that. Um, and um, so I just went to Sydney and it's like, you know, I had an uncle that lived there. And so I stayed with him while I uh, looked for a job. And like I sent, there was like a hundred, I don't know, maybe it was definitely at least a hundred more than 80, you know, companies that I had, like I had my little pathetic college resume and I was just determined to find a place just to like work. And I'd, I'd worked all through college. So I had money saved up and, um, and I was just like, I'm just gonna work for free. I just wanted to do this, you know, and I just wanna see if I like it, you know? And, you know, cause it's like after graduation, it's like, so it's kind of like combining kind of like a gap year plus actually working, you know? Um, and, um, and yeah, in two weeks, within two weeks, I, um, I like, I, I sent my resume to like, a, you know, about maybe, yeah, 100 places. And um, I got two responses. I got one interview and I was like, that job is mine. And like, I just, I like, I went, I like practiced the route to get there, like took the, like timed it out so that I would be like super early. And, um, and I was just so determined to get it. And um, they gave it to me, awesome. you know? And um, so I started working in production design as, um, you know, as a, um, as a PA in the art department. And uh, so it's just like you're just sweeping up sawdust and, you know, and whatever they asked me to do, I was like, run. I would run to do everything, you know. And, um, and uh, yeah, I started like first, like, you know, you're sweeping up sawdust and, you know, then they're like, okay, you help build. So I, like the first thing I built was like I built this giant cactus, mm -hmm. you know, you're just sitting there like making sure that every like needle is like perfect, like the you know, spike is perfect. And, um, and, uh, and then it got me on the set of my first commercial. It's for like this British car company, or this British car called the Vauxhall Vectra. I don't even know if they still make them anymore. Um, but it was like a big commercial, like the DP Paul Cameron shot it. Like, you know, he's, a, he's huge, you know, he's wonderful. It's, he did Collateral as an example, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is like an amazing film. And um, it started at Harris, the fabulous, great national treasure at Harris. Like, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he, he's, he's amazing. Um, and, um, and so I was just like, oh, I'm this lowly art department PA with Ed Harris, and like, he's amazing, and I, I think I want to go to film school, and I was like, I don't really know what, to, you know, I'll just ask him, just you know, <laughs> like a dick, <laughs> I'm just gonna ask him, you know? And, um, and I finally worked up the courage, you know, to, to ask him, and I sort of like, he's like, he's asked me a couple, you know, we, I, you know, until we started talking about Pollock, his film, his brilliant film, and um, uh, uh, he started asking questions about me, and then he was like, you should go to USC. So I applied and I got in. And that was kind of, and then like six weeks later, I was in LA, you know, you know. Very, very cool. Yeah. And, um, and so from USC, uh, you, you had a, an award-winning thesis film. Talk about that film. Yeah, um, yeah, The Artist Talking. Uh, I wanted to, I was really heavily influenced by like um, sort of early, you know, earlier films, like uh, not earlier films, but sort of older films, like films from the 70s. So it's really like sort of Taxi Driver. Uh, Carnal Knowledge by Mike Nichols, um, but also like um, The Passenger by Antonioni, you know, and wanted to really, you know, all these, char these characters like really had these sort of, um, I mean, we're today, there wasn't a word for it then, but today, you know, we call, we call it to toxic masculinity. And I wanted to sort of explore that um, uh, and kind of try to find out like, <laughs> this is the problem with them, um, with a lot of thesis films or a lot of student films, you're like, I'm gonna solve this issue, you know? And, um, and so we, we kind of just, we did it and like, um, well, when I say that we did it, we got a lot of help. Like, 
we got help from Panavision. They gave us a new filmmaker grant to to go make it, and then um, it kind of opened up a lot of doors. You know, we shot in Chicago, which that city was very kind to us. Um, like we have a lot of exterior shots, and they're like, you don't need permits. We kind of just we kind of just bluffed our way through it. You know, they're like, you don't just don't worry about it. Just build your camera, pop out, shoot the city any way you want to. Wow. I know it was really they're really nice to us. Um, you know, I'll always be really grateful for that. It's really. Filmmaker friendly town, uh, at least from my perspective, filmmaker friendly town, um, and um, um, and we kind of just yeah. So we 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 shot the thing. We had a really lovely cast and amazing crew, and um, and uh, you know we just cut it together. <laughs> and it sounds really, you know, you're sort of you're boiling down a lot a zillion decisions, and are like, oh, we just did it. You know, it's a zillion decisions. We just did it. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it. I'm still really proud of that movie, you know, um, and it kind of did what I wanted it to do, which is like it kind of it played on the festival circuit a little bit. Um, it got just enough attention to kind of get my front toe in the door, mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it got me rep represented, you know, right out of film school, and so that's been kind of, you know, the game began kind of. Very you know. cool. Yeah. And uh, in 2015, you made your first TV pilot sale. Um, talk about that, Swing State. Yeah. So. In between then and um, the thesis film, um, so I like I graduated from with I did you know got out of film school and was like you know working as an editor in documentaries and then doing directing branded content and then um, and then in 2011 uh, I got a call from my mom and she's like uh, I think I have leukemia they gave me six months oh, wow. and so I was working as a producer um, and editor at NBC at the time it's one of those sort of like it's like broadcast news kind of jobs where you're just running around with stacks of tapes, like running into really powerful people and just like everything just goes haywire. It was like one of those jobs, kind of, um, which is a great job when you're out of, like right out of school. And um, and so she called me this and like she told, called me and told me this and um, I just put in my two weeks and I just left. And I just packed up my SUV um, and like left, left LA and I was like, I'm just gonna go to Chicago and sort of like be with her while she's, and like, you know, I, um, my dad was like, you know, he's like working abroad. And so it's like, I was like, somebody needs to be there, you know? And so I just went home and um, just kind of like left everything. And so the reason I say, I, I'm phrasing it like, you know, I'm sort of building this kind of context is because I had written Swing State. I tried to write it as a movie um, and it just wasn't working as a movie. It was like, it was clearly a show, wanted to be a show. I didn't know how to write television, you know, uh, at the time. Uh, and, um, and so I just took this movie and I just like cut it in half and I was like, now it's a pilot, right? <laughs> and it had no structure, yeah. you know, I like to work as a, as a pilot, but I was like, you know, now it's a pilot, you know, just sort of being sort of, I guess, bluffing sort of, you know, uh, sort of maybe a little bit brash, I don't know. But, um, and so while I was away, and this is how kind of like how the, the, at the sale ended up happening over time, uh, the script, you know, people, it was not a, a pilot per se in terms of a, a sort of technical function, but the voice was there, mm -hmm. right? And this is the thing that I kept hearing back. It was like, well, the voice is really good. We like the voice. We like the voice. And I was like, okay. Um, and so it kept getting passed around. I had no idea when any of this was happening. Mm -hmm. While I was taking care of my mother, it was like sort of moving its way around the circuitry of Hollywood, you know? And um, when I finally came back, um, it got me a new management team, mm -hmm. and that got me uh, my first agent, and then that got me that sale, you know? Wow. Yeah, people I have, and I'm like, I have no idea who read it. You know, I have no idea. I mean, I know some people have read it, obviously, but the people who are passing it around, I have no idea, you know? And, uh, but people just, they just, they just kind of liked it. And it is really kind of one of those weird things where you're just like, well, you know, my, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, she has this really fabulous phrase and she's like, you know, you never, never, you never really know what's working for you behind the scenes, you know? And, you know, it's true. You really don't. Um, so I'm very sort of happy and fortunate and lucky to sort of had the right kind of material re reach the right people, you know, and that's really what it is. You know, it's like you can make it, but it's the right material with the right people at the right time, you know, and so much that I was not in control of at all. Um, and, uh, yeah, we sold it and that opened just all these doors, you know, um, because that led to, um, my first TV pitch. Uh, which we sold in the room, which is, again, it's like, you know, it never, I've yet to repeat that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, it's a, that's a tough one, you know, and it was the first time I'd ever really pitched formally, you know? Um, and then that led to, um, I got a 
I was in, and that was about um, financial analysts. You know, the show didn't get made, but it was a really fabulous learning experience. And the team over there um, at TNT were just amazing, you know. Um, and um, uh, and so I was in New York uh, doing research for the show, and then I called for my agent, and, there, and he's like, "Whoopi Goldberg wants to meet with you. She read Swing State. She has this other idea, you know, she wants you to take a look at." And so I met with her um, at the offices of the View, and I was. Just, it was amazing. She's a genius, and um, and uh, um, and so we started developing that. Um, of course, as soon as we did the deal, there was an executive changeover at the network, and so when that happens, you're just like they want to keep the relationship with her. So they ended up doing the deal and developing it. Um, this is just my assumptions. I didn't. I wasn't privy to any of those emails or phone calls. Um, uh, but I'm like, well, they're clearly not going to make this show because it's like a new, it's a new thing. Um, but again, it's kind of like, you know, it's, you learn a lot by doing the work, you know, um, and so you just show up and, you know, uh, uh, you give it everything you've got, you know, and, um, you know, because this is not just about, you know, every time you make a sale, it's a success, you know, and so I was like, all right, well, this is going to be about the best success I can have with this thing, and, um, and we're just going to go with it. Very cool. And then from there, so you, so you developed and sold a few TV projects, but then you moved to features. Uh, yeah, so I was writing, um, so I had sort of, uh, so the, um, with, again, this comes back to Swing State, it opened up a lot of doors, and one of them was actually in the feature world, I sort of, um, I guess strangely enough, but you know, nowadays, you know, we hadn't gone full, like, because now it's very sort of amorphous, you know, it's like people are sort of moving all over the place, and kind of, uh, and at the time, and the, I say, when I say at the time, it sounds like, you know, pre-internet, and it's not, it was just, it was like a handful of years ago, but things move really fast now. Um, uh, it's funny when you watch Jerry Maguire, he's like, things move pretty fast. I'm like, no, 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 now they move really fast. Um, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, and so we had sort of like, you know, they, they had really liked Swing State and, you know, they were kind of what they were, this is one production company, uh, LD Entertainment, and they really liked it. Um, and so we sort of developed it a little bit there, didn't really go anywhere, but like, you know, most, like most things, you know, just kind of, um, that's just kind of the nature of the game. And, um, but, you know, again, it's all about the relationships that you build, you know, and the people that you work with. And, and when you find really good people, I'm just like a huge, this is like, you know, a mantra. It's like when you find great people, treat them well, treat them with respect, you know, be kind of them, you know. Um, I'm not saying don't be a pushover, but, you know, uh, you know, just don't be a dick. <laughs> just don't be a dick. Um, and, um, and so I just called them, I just called um, one of the executives just to say hello, and I was like, "Do you want to grab coffee?" And she was like, "Well, hey, we're working on this. Um, we're working on this remake of this really great film. Um, and uh, do you want to work on it a little bit?" And, uh, and I was like, "Yeah, that sounds great." And I was like, a huge fan of the. Um, I was a huge fan of the of the uh, the original film, and and so that kind of got me into features, and um, and uh, it was really exciting, you know. Yeah, and it continues to be. Very very cool. And uh, you you had a very unique experience when you volunteered for a political consulting group. Right. Uh, tell me about that whole ex experience. Okay. So it's funny um, because that was actually happening at the exact same time I was working on the movie. The movie, by the way, was the remake of Jacob's Ladder. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, it was, um, I was like, that movie, the, the first movie is just, you watch it, and you're just like, this movie shouldn't work. But Adrian Lyne is such a just brilliant director, yeah. you know, and Tim Robbins' performance. And it was just, oh, my goodness. Um, and, um, and so it was a real honor to, to work on that, and especially having it be, um, you know, a, a, a black cast, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, um, it introduced me to really a lot of amazing people. So as well as I'm working on that, um, this, uh, this guy, that very polarizing person got elected president, um, I was putting it very politely, a very polarizing person got elected president. Okay. And, um. Uh, and so, of course, us, all, a lot of us in Hollywood were just like, oh my god, it's all ending. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the whole thing is going to end. I and, remember uh, that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, uh, and like all, you know, good, um, <laughs> like all good Democrats, we, uh, instead of blaming other people, we're just like, oh, it's our fault. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just going inward, right? And so we're like, well, you know, it's the, we were looking at the sort of democratic messaging and we're like, well, we're just, this is clearly not working. And so um, a bunch of us got together 
and like I mean, and when I say a bunch of us, I mean like people with like like just phenomenal, you know, gold statue like kind of success. And then me at the very if there's a totem pole, here's the bottom of the totem pole. Like here's me, right? Um, and uh, you know, and they were again, they were very nice to me, and they just let me sort of tag along. Um, and so we met with a lot of really, so we met with you know, sort of a lot of congressmen that you've heard and uh, congresswomen and um, and senators, and you know, sort of offering our services. Um, and it kind of got boiled down to I think you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we did a lot of work. I don't know if we if we affected anything. At least we had there was a, there were good conversations that were had. Um, it got kind of surmised. We had a meeting with um, Senator Al Franken. Uh, he told this really funny story though. Of um, he was like, and it basically kind of like sort of, sort of surmised on the, in many ways how sort of I think sort of my takeaway from Washington. Um, and he was like, he was telling a story about you know in, you know he was on SNL obviously, and uh, he was like you know during the summers you know. He's talking to all of us, right? So we're at a big conference table. Um, and he's like, you know, during the summers, they let you go, you know, shoot movies. And, you know, back in the 80s, you know, people, movie sets were sort of much more sort of, you know, more open. So people could sort of walk on. And uh, so, you know, you make friends with people. And we're, I was hanging out with this one guy, you know, throughout the course of shooting this film. And uh, at the end, he's like, you know, uh, I'm like, well, what do you want to do? What are you going to do after the movie's over? And he's like, well, I was thinking about that. This is Al Franken's friend. And he's like, um, uh, I think I want to go work on SNL. And Al Franken's like, oh really? Do you want to? Okay. What do you want to do? And he's like, well, I don't know if you really have noticed this, but sometimes SNL isn't funny. And he says this like to his face. And um, uh, um, and Al Franken's like very, you know, very. He's like, okay, well, what do you, what do you want to do about it? Um, or what do you want to do? Do you want to like, do you want to write, you know, or do you want to act? And he's like, no. Here's what I want to do. Um, uh, you write the sketches, and then you create the sketches, and then you do the sketches. And then I'll tell you if they're funny. And he looked at us and he's like, "This is what you guys are doing to us." <laughs> and this is huge. Like Oscar-winning producer sitting next to me, he turns to me and he's like, "This is the best meeting we've had all day." <laughs> now, like, um, but the, to that point though, I think it's just you know, it's what I learned that is like you know, it's they have a there's a job and they have their way of doing things, you know, and they have really high price consultants, just like we have consultants and. And just like everybody has consultants, and um, you know, uh, we met well. I, we didn't do any harm, so that was good, you know. Um, but yeah, it's um, you know, who knew that changing policy would be so difficult? Very cool, very cool. And, and so, um, in 2020, you had a chance to direct television. Yeah, so yeah, right before the pandemic, it, you know, so it just got in, got in under the wire. Um, uh, that was, I was very, again, it was just like really great people, and I was very fortunate to be asked. Um, now, it wasn't just like I was just sitting there and they sort of like plucked me. Like, mm -hmm. I had, um, I kind of, with um, my reps, I did a sort of very sort of, vel I, I, what I call it's like the, or my wife, it's actually my wife's term, the velvet hammer, you know? So it's like very kind of like just every week at the exact same time, I just like send an email, hey, what's going on with this? Week goes by, hey, what's going on with this, you know? And then eventually, um, they're like, oh, hey, we have a show for you, you know? Um, and it's not like, hey, what's going on with this? It's you know, it's you know, it's it's something a little bit uh, more eloquent than that, or at least uh, respectful. <laughs> what should I say? Um, and uh, and it was yeah, it's this episode um, of this BET show called All the Way Black, and um, and it was really kind of like this was a sort of it was a sort of a sort of um, a look at uh, uh, black representation in American sitcoms over the years. And so for that to be like the first thing that I got to direct for television, I was so proud of that. I'm so proud of that now. And so thankful to, you know, Brian and Cisco and Matt and Royal for, for bringing me on board um, and, uh, and, you know, giving me the opportunity because, you know, to come from, to like not want to be like resisting to do film, you know, and then seeing do the right thing and then have that be like, well, now I have to do this. It's not like, oh, I, it's not like, oh, I want to make movies. Like I have to do this, you know? Um, and, uh, and then for that to be the first thing on television, like that was everything, you know, mm. you know, it was, it was great. And so your most recent project is the feature Baku. T uh, what can you tell me about that? Baku. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Baku kind of started the emotional sort of point of germination was, um, watching the testimony and now it has nothing to do Baku. I should, 
uh, it has nothing to do with what I'm about to describe uh, at all in terms of like plot or anything like that. But in terms of like, just the emotional kind of, the sort of emotional uh, kind of core, or at least the point, like I said, the point of germination. Um, was uh, the uh, testimony of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford uh, during the, the Supreme Court Justice confirmation hearings. And there was like this, just in, uh, this insane internal tension that I was sort of like feeling watching that. But then also this pressure, all this tremendous pressure from the sort of outside world to sort of like force something to happen, you know? Um, and I was like, I don't know what movie that's gonna be, but that's what I'm gonna write about, you know. And so, um, and so I, you know, I'd always sort of like loved, um, you know, once you, it's like, you know, when you love movies, you're like, you see these movies, and you're like, you're like, well, what are these filmmakers like? And then you start watching this stuff, and then you know. Um, and so, you know, I'd always been, I grew up just, not grew up, but like, I've watched um, Guillermo del Toro films my entire life, and so um, for whatever reason, like. That I mean, he's gone. He said many, many times that Onibaba by Kaneto Shindo is like one of his favorite films, and um, and I was just kind of like looking through movies. I was like, where's the point? Where, where am I going to start with this feeling? And I came across Onibaba, and I was like, that's it. And I just knew instantly. And I actually hadn't seen it at the time, um, but I saw I saw like a couple of the posters, and I saw just like stills of the performance, and I was like, that's the feeling. I just when you know, you just know. You're like, that's the feeling. Um, and I watched it, and then I rewatched it, and I rewatched it, and then I started watching all of Kaneto Shindo's films, and then that set me on this, uh, this sort of like really fabulous like um, you know Japanese horror kind of like spree where I'm just like watching like um, Jingoku by Nobuo Nakagawa and like you know Under the Blossom Cherry Trees by Masahiro Shinoda and like just going and going and going and going, sort of expanding this out, and then watching um, you know like Hour of the Wolf by Mark Bergman and just kind of a sort of like really sort of getting out there. Um, and I was like, okay, I think I have enough. Um, and so basically what Baku is, is um, there's this old Japanese um, sort of piece of folklore and sort of it's rooted in that and that's what Baku is, you know? And so, um, and it's just about survival, you know, in a, uh, in a male dominated world and these two women, um, uh, these two female, female, uh, female protagonists. And, but, um, you know, it's, it's them surviving in this world that's dominated by men, you know? And that's what the movie's about. I think the thing that's really sort of the, the hope for the film, you know, I mean, first of all, let's get it made. <laughs> let's get have it be good. Yeah. Um, but the real hope is that like, I, and I guess the vision for what this really could be in terms of a huge project is um, uh, like if we get to make it and then kind of pass the baton off to other up, up underrepresented filmmakers, you know, and then have them uh, do their own version of Baku because the thing is, if you look at the the um, the actual folklore, the folklore originated in China, you know, and then was adopted um, in Japan during the Edo era, you know, um, and so it's kind of like you know the 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 actual creature is like it's made of different animals, you know, the different animal parts, and then as it changes from country to country, um, the, the animal parts change, and I was like, well, then anybody can tell the story, you know, so I'm going to tell my version, but it's like then if if this becomes a success. Then we can power other people to tell their versions, you know, uh, which is an idea that is really exciting, you know, to, to be able to do that. Very, very cool. Yeah. I love that idea of developing from an emotion. Um, oh. That is really, really neat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, for better or for worse, that's kind of what sort of like led me, what's led me here. <laughs> it's put me in this chair and it put me in a car direct, driving to this place, you know, but, um, and now it's, it's not sort of reactive. You know, because so much of life is just reacting to things, right? Um, you know, something that happens to you, you know, like, well, I'm not going to do that again, you know? And, uh, but when something, and so the trick is always, like, trying to find, instead of what is the reaction, you're like, what am I attracted to? How do I lead myself on a path to that, you know? Um, you know, and when it works, it works out great. Like, it led me to my wife. I'm going to be a dad in April. Like, that's amazing, you know? Like, I'm good at these things. I'm going to be fucking great at that like it just it's you just feel it you know um sorry i cursed <laughs> you know and um and i think that when it's just you know we call it listening to your heart or whatever whatever you call it like um you know if you can really kind of listen to the water diviner you know um then i you know it tends to it, at least from my perspective it served me well you know very cool. We're going to take a quick sponsor break right now, and we're going to come back to talk all about the feature draft intensive.
AVGearGuy.com uses state-of-the-art technology to bring new life to old films and videos, like the Lost Betty White series Pet Set, which they recently restored for its 50th anniversary. They can apply the same technology to your documentary, film and video archive, and family videos. Visit AVGearGuy.com for details. DrivingFootage.com provides 360-degree driving plates for film and TV. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height adjustable rig is available for custom shoots. Visit DrivingFootage.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. And we're back, and we're back to hear all about the Feature Draft Intensive, right. and I should mention, um, check the website at scriptanatomy.com to find out the schedule of when the next one is that you can take part in. Yeah. Um, but So tell me about the Feature Draft Intensive. Who is it for? What does it offer? Okay, so uh, as we say on the website, it's really, you know, what we say is um, the sort of um, the prerequisite, and there's a prerequisite. It's a little loosey-goosey. I mean, we say it's anyone who's taken the Feature Development Lab, or uh, the equivalent of, you know? Um, but it's really, it's like some pe people who've had some experience, you know, su like not super significant, but like, you know, if you take in this class and the Vision Development Lab is like, it's really intense. At Script Anatomy, I think the thing that I love, and I've taught like, I haven't taught, but like, um, but I've, you know, I went to University of Iowa and did, you know, you learn how to become, it was like the first time learning how to become a storyteller there. And then USC, and I studied like Irish drama poetry literature at Trinity College. I took Robert McKee, you know, right out of film school. I was like, because you're just like, you're just trying to learn how to do it. You know, you're just trying to, and because you just want to master the thing, right? Um, and Script Anatomy is the first place I've ever seen where they just completely demystify the entire process. You know, it feels like magic. It's not magic. You know, this is not magic. I mean, it's like, it looks like magic. It's movie magic. But there are, there's just a zillion tactical choices, you know, whether it's like setting up lights or like, you know, hitting your marks as an actor or whatever. Um, and in screenwriting, it's it's the same, you know. Um, and I think part of I think what we do is just like, all right, well, here here are the things that you actually do. Like for example, um, so okay, so to answer your question, uh, you know, it's for people who really have taken the feature development lab or the equivalent thereof. So it's like they 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 have and they have to come in with an outline that's ready to go, ready to be adapted to a to a feature to a first draft. Um, and so that's really like that's that's the first thing. And so. Um, they should have an outline before the, the course. Do you, do you have any time um, before the course that you check with them about their outline? So the important thing is to have, to have a fully fleshed out outline. Not uh, the notes for an outline, but the full thing, like, you know. Like beat by beat. 10 pages, yeah, yeah, yeah like the full and, thing. Uh, and so um, do, you, do you check with them in the week before the course and, yeah. and make sure they have what they need? Yeah, so they send, they send, a, um, they send the outline and we kind of have like a pre-class, there's four official classes, we kind of have like a pre-week where it's like I read all their outlines, I give them notes, you know, and then we just hit the ground running, you know, so it's like that first, so it's like there's, um, you know, we give the time to write, you know, between the classes obviously. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it's like the first class you meet, we talk about your outlines, you know, um, here, like, and we sort of, and the thing about Script Anatomy that's really great um, is that uh, everyone who signs up, you know, they tend to be really serious about this, about this, not just the craft, but also the business of filmmaking, you know. Then because they come, they'll give notes to each other too, right? They give notes to each other. There's a huge, there's a whole classroom discussion, which is really great. It's the, um, actually the Iowa, the Iowa pioneered that, the sort of, you know, the sort of the circle, the circle of the classroom discussion um, in the writer's workshop there. Uh, and uh, and so we go and, and, and we do that and they you know they give each other notes and they feed off each other and you know and what we consider this to be is like really sort of commun community building you know I know that term got a bad rap a couple years ago but really that's what this is it's just Hollywood is a community of, of artists and you know and um, and that's how you get better is by sort of giving each other notes and you know reading each other's stuff and supporting each other um, and so it's really just about you know integrating them into this you know um, and so they kind of like figure out, you know, how, what, what is the story they really want to tell? How do they want to tell it? You know, and, and then we give them the sort of technical tools to do that. And so we go that first week, you know, give notes on the outline. Second class, they have, they, they, we give notes on their first act. Mm -hmm. Third class, it's, um, they have, they, we go over acts one and two. Fourth class, fully, full script. Wow. And yeah. to be clear, there's a few weeks in between. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is time to, there is time to do the work. I mean, it is, Pretty, it is pretty quick. It's lightning fast, um, but um, 
you know, the, the, uh, the, the, we have this thing where, you know, you talk about any big project in Hollywood, where you're just like, well, you know, it looks tough, but then it always, it comes together because it always does, mm -hmm. you know? And um, people find the time to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, it's not easy, but it is very doable, you know? I mean, that's really, when you think about it, doing a draft of a feature yeah. in, in that compressed the time is pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive, you know? But again, it's like at USC, um, not to keep promoting this school, I'm <laughs> but it is like, I, the thing is, is that in that first semester, what we do is, uh, and I don't know if they still do it, uh, but it's the, the 507 class, you know? And um, you do a new short film every three weeks. Wow. Yeah. So you get one week to write, one week to cut, or one week to write, you one week to write and, pro and produce it, right? One week to actually shoot it, one week to edit it, and the cycle starts over again immediately. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, and so you see, like, you see pretty quick, like, who can kind of handle themselves and who can't. Um, and there is a rate of attrition, you know, but, like, there's a rate of attrition with anything like this, you know? Um, and, uh, and so script anatomy, I think the thing that, one of the things I really like about it is that we're just like, all right, go, mm. go. You like, you've got the skill set, you know, do you have, but it's like, you know, being successful is so much more than just being talented. You know, it's like, can you really kind of push it and pull it together in a way that not only makes sense, but is also entertaining. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's entertaining that it's, these are delivery devices for emotion. Can you get people to, to feel something, entertain them? all within a very sort of strict set of parameters, you know? You also cover some topics um, within the, the lab, um, deepening emotional moments, yeah. amping up stakes, things like that. Can you talk about that kind of, um, I don't know what you would call that, like a learning part of it? Well, it's really kind of, um, uh, it's deepening uh, mastery of fundamentals, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and that's really what we do, is we, we, we're really about mastering these, these concepts. Um, and the only way to master it is just, you know, the way I describe it, I was like, you just got to be, you're just in the NBA shooting free throws during practice. You know, you're just like, you're just taking shots. You just got to, it's just repetition. You got to do it over and over and over again. And so, you know, like with, it's kind of like that, that, um, it's like any, any, any game, you know, it's like, uh, um, like go, the, the game go, you know, like they didn't life of pie. It's like, you know, easy to learn, lifetime to master, that kind of thing, right? And so they learn everything in the feature development lab. Um, and then we just, and then we do an accelerated sort of like, we go over these principles again, um, you know, and sort of like, okay. And then you sort of, you go over these principles again with the work they've already completed now. So now like that work is no longer, it's, it's, they're turning it, they're adapting it, but now they're not in the process of creating the idea. They have more perspective on it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that, that enables them to go deeper into it. Um, and so we do, yeah, so it's like, you know, deepening character relationships. We look at um, deepening, you know, like how do, how do we express theme, you know? Um, this is one thing that I'm particularly, that I, that, I, that I think that we do is really great is that we, dis we de completely demystify the idea of likability, you know, like likable characters. Like, like that word likable is so confusing, you know? And, um, and what does it mean? <laughs> you know, and we don't use that word, you know, <laughs> we have our own word. We do have our own word actually. And, um, you know, and we sure like, this is how, this is how you get from this feeling that we have, that you want, that you want this character to be, here are the things you actually do to put it down on paper, you know, and it's, it feels mechanical, but story structure is mechanical. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things, most of, most of filmmaking is mechanical, you know, and, um, and again, it's like once you start doing this for a living, you realize, all right, these are, it's not just about how you feel, but you're like, actually, how do, what are the things that I have to do? What do I have to build? What are the pieces I have to put in place to get people to have an emotional experience? You know, it's, I mean, and that's not even my idea. Hitchcock first said that, you know? Yeah. Um, the thing that, I guess the secret sauce that I bring to it is that I look at it very, like, you know, from the perspective of a director. And what I tell my students is, you're all the first director on your movie. You know, right? because the, the writer is the first person who's seeing the vision happen in their head, right? And so they're envisioning it, they're writing it down. And so when you're looking at, for example, we go over like set pieces, like how to write a set piece, how to write character windows. And, and what I say is like, you know, you have to, because if you're, if you're a new writer, the environment for new writers is really punishing in this town, right? So you're gonna write something that seems conceivable to pull off financially, right? So if you go in and write like this zillion dollar movie and you're a baby green writer, everyone's gonna be like, I don't know what to do with this, you know? 
Um, so you have to envision your story in a way that seems like you can pull it off on a budget, you know? And I guess that's one of the tools that you sort of learn making these little shorts, and then you kind of just apply it to sort of big Hollywood filmmaking. And then you look at like, there are massive movies, and you know, Chris Nolan is like, I think he's probably one of the most more, more famous people for doing something like that, where he'll have these huge sets, but then he also still uses these film, like, you know, film school techniques that he's been doing for his entire career. And I was like, that's kind of like the magic trick, is like, how do you pull off something that feels big with, with the, the tools that are actually, you know, uh, quite attainable and humble, you know? Yeah. And so we kind of look at it from that, I look at it from that perspective too. Because if you go in and just write like these huge expensive things, people are gonna be like, okay, but then why you, you know? And so, um, uh, yeah, and so we kind of, again, demystify all of that stuff too. Very, yeah. very cool. Um, well, t tell me about some of your student success stories. And, and I, don't, I don't just mean afterwards, but even in the course in terms of breakthroughs that they've made with their scripts and things yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I had this, um, do you want me to like, actually name people? You don't need to name okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, I actually got this, uh, this wonderful uh, note from a student um, and they said, um, uh, thanks to you, I will never write, uh, I will never write uh, boring or polite dialogue ever again. Oh, and I was like, oh, that was great. You know, that was really nice. Um, I don't know, it's a motorcycle. <laughs> um, uh, that was really nice, you know, to sort of, to see people sort of open up. And I think that's the whole point. I mean, the thing is, I, we're instructors, but I really look at myself as like, I'm just, I'm directing these writers, you know? And directing writers in many ways is like directing actors. And you want to bring out the best out of them. You want to bring out the best in them. And, um, and you want to be able to see like, and you don't want it to, but you don't want it to feel like it's your idea, my idea. I don't want it to feel like it's my idea. You want it to be their idea. Mm -hmm. You just want to set the stage to let them do their thing, you know? And, um, and so to hear that kind of compliment, cause that was not my intent. Like I already thought this person was fabulously creative to begin with. And then to hear that from them, I was like, all right, this is working. Like I really, I, you know, this is good. Well, and I, and I think about that, it, it's, it's learning a tool that will stay with them in every script they write. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, if they stick with it. I mean, that's kind of whole thing with mastery is that you just gotta stick with it. You just keep shooting free throws, you know? Um, and, uh, but it, I think a lot of the thing, a lot of the times with people in education, but it's really just work and being a, being a human being, is that really a lot of times it's like, you don't, the window of possibility isn't always open. You don't see, you don't see how you could possibly do something like, you know, what you see on, on a screen, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that is something that's really great about this place is that like, we kind of be like, oh no, here's the window, here's a latch. Here are the steps <laughs> to opening the latch, you know? And then here's how you open up the window and then this is how you get outside, you know? And it's like, yeah. that's kind of it, you know? Very, very cool. Yeah. So, so what are the, some of the biggest mistakes you see people making on or off the page? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's so difficult to, that's a hard question to answer, I'm, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna answer it. So let's talk about creative vision, right? You know, when you say creative vision, people like sort of stick to their guns, but sometimes, you know, you, know, you could say, you could look at that, and if someone's doing something that like you don't think is working, they're, oh, they're just being obdurate, you know? Um, and, um, and I think that, what I would say, instead of, instead of looking at it in terms of mistakes, I would say one of the best gifts you can give to yourself is to, A, well, to know yourself, but um, uh, why do you need to tell the story and why does this story need to be told, you know? If you can answer those two questions, you'll be great, you know? And I, I answer them like really honest, like brutally honest, you know? Um, uh, why do you need to tell the story and why does the story need to be told, you know? And that clarifies and cuts through so much noise, yeah. you know? Um, because here's the thing, it was, um, I saw, uh, I won't name the show, but it was, it was tipped to be one of the, gr maybe the greatest show ever made. Um, it had a bunch of dragons in it. And, um, and at the end, you know, there was this line, uh, and the line was, people love stories. You know, they're picking like this new king, and he's like, people love stories. Nobody has a better story than this guy, right? And, um, and for whatever reason, that line kind of just like, I kind of bumped on that line. And it was delivered by one of the fa most fabulous actors, like one of the, you know, working today. He's so, he's so brilliant. Um, but the line itself, 
You know, nothing to do with the performance, just the line itself. Be like, people love stories. And I was like, why is that? Why am I bumping on that? And it took me months. I was like, it wasn't even like a year later. And I was like, why is it my bumping on that? And I was like, oh, it's not, and people love stories, but that's kind of like the sort of aftermath of it. And what I realized is that people need stories, you know? People need stories to make sense of their lives, you know? If anything, the last two years has shown us that life is just, it's constriction and chaos, you know? That there are things, there's so many things that we're not in control of, you know? Um, you never know what's working for you, right? And, but also you never really know, you really never know really yet the whole picture of what's working against you either. And so because there's all these mysteries, you know, uh, people need stories to feel a sense of, to derive meaning from it, for context, for catharsis, you know? Um, and I was like, that's why filmmaking and that's why storytelling is such a sort of potent, necessary uh, thing, you know? Why it, it became a necessary vocation for me, a profession. Um, you know, like I come from scientists and I don't want to be a storyteller. I was like, and this was always, I guess this was always the pull, seeing do the right thing. That was, I was like, I needed that story. I needed that story to make sense of my life. You know, what I experienced, you know, being a biracial kid in a very sort of lily white suburban, you know, America. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, yeah, people need, people need stories. And so, to, and so to, to try to tie it all together, if you can answer, why do you need to tell this story? And why does this story need to be told? You know, um, it'll serve you well. Very cool. Well, I actually can't think of a better way um, to end up. Um, it's a great point to end on. Um, I, what, what do you think, if you could just give advice to somebody who's starting out, um, what advice would you give? Like, what, what, is the, what is the one thing that you think will, will make somebody a successful writer? Don't be shy. You know, um, whatever you are, whoever you are, wherever you are, do not be shy. Um, uh, there is, uh, yeah, if you've got a story that needs to be told, tell it and tell it to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, um, and I, I think that's, that's the most important thing. Very, very cool. Yeah. Well, everybody, make sure that you check out the feature draft intensive at scriptanatomy.com. Like I said, uh, it does reoccur throughout the year, so check the schedule to find out when it's on. And the classes do fill up fast, so book early. And, um, and you can actually filter by um, instructor to, to find out which courses Amitabh Clem is teaching, because uh, there may be others in the future. And um, Thank you so much for taking your time today. Thank and, you. And uh, are you on social media? Uh, yeah, it's uh, look at me on my Instagram. It's just at Amitav Clem. Very cool. Make sure you follow uh, Amitav Clem on Instagram. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you. Please follow me on Twitter for the latest updates. At Gray Jones is my handle. Make sure to bookmark tvwriterpodcast.com and scriptmag.com. You can find the video version of this podcast at iTunes, Podbean, and on YouTube. Make sure you do subscribe to all these places. Audio only, you can find us at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or Pandora. And on Instagram, you can follow at TV Writer Podcast.